and of course all the issue of money that was taken over by the private banks bit by bit. Then the whole of uh, government uh, shifted from serving the public to serving the uh, corporations in market competition. The whole of the social order has experienced a great reversal from human evolution to uh, one, as they say, can only diagnose it as a, a cancer uh, system that has run out of control. Every single one of the features of, uh, of a cancer are at work. You try to think of what goes on with a cancer at any level, the generic properties of it, and you see it at work with the transnational money sequences, especially the exponential self-multiplication with no committed life function. and taking over everything, appropriating all resources, invading all, and always never able to do it right itself. It's not capable of really reproducing life functions at all. It has no life coordinates to it. It's, it's all about, just as a cancer on the micro level, it's all about appropriating resources of the life host to multiply itself for what? For more multiplication. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the August 7th, 2013 ZM Global Radio Show, the podcast for the Zeitgeist Movement. My name is Jason Lord, and I'll be your host today. I have some fun topics to cover, the most notable being the Zeitgeist Media Festival that happened just this past weekend, uh, the main event being in Los Angeles, California. But just to uh, note the opening montage you just heard, that was something I put together. And those were excerpts from an interview with John McMurtry on the Progressive Radio Network with Steve Lenman talking about his book, The Cancer Stage of Capitalism, which goes into how our economic structure uh, has actually decoupled from what's called the life ground. Instead of actually having transactions that take into account our environment uh, and the physical world that we live in, we have a system designed around money sequences and tracking money sequences and the multiplication of money sequences. And he puts this into the context of the human body and health uh, and actually shows how this multiplication of money sequences has become a cancer, and you end up with this conundrum, this contradiction in capitalism, where it ends up not being sustainable. Because as you know, if you actually look at a physical system with a host, a life host, and it gets infected with a virus, and the virus multiplies, it ends up destroying the life host itself. And in our case, it's referring to the physical life system, the environment, and the earth. We have a, a mechanism of consumption which is not sustainable within a finite system. And there you have the contradiction of capitalism, where it's not sustainable on that level. If you pick up his book, I got to tell you, it's quite a read. It's very dense. Uh, he's one of these writers where each paragraph is equivalent to a page, uh, if you understand my meaning by that. Uh, I'm still going back and referencing part of his books. And I've also noticed that he has a tendency, he speaks uh, in his radio shows, his language is very similar to how he writes. It's always interesting to me how someone uh, develops language and they incorporate it uh, as they learn and find expression through their writing. They kind of take on a new vernacular and it gets incorporated into their everyday speech. So when you, if you listen to his interviews on the Progressive Radio Network and read his book, he writes like he speaks. So I hope that inspires some of you to go out and check out his work. Oh, and before I forget, anyone listening to this podcast for the first time today, if you're hearing this show on Blog Talk Radio, um, there's a couple of ways where it's syndicated. One is through an RSS feed uh, up in the top. Uh, if you go to blogtalkradio.com forward slash ZM Global Radio, uh, you'll find uh, this recording. This is where the podcast is sourced from. We're syndicated out on iTunes. So for those of you who use iTunes, it's real easy to subscribe to all these shows. Through Blog Talk, you just click the iTunes button or go to the iTunes podcast app. They have separated the podcasts from radio stations with uh, Apple iTunes. So uh, you can search up TZM Global Radio or ZM Global Radio. It'll pop right up, and uh, you can subscribe. It'll automatically download all the shows and the history with the names and titles and dates, so it's real easy to go through. Um, but now also we are most recently syndicated on TuneIn Radio, TuneIn.com. Uh, I discovered TuneIn as an app on my television. Uh, my TV has apps in it like Netflix and things like that. And I was going through the little app section, and it popped up this new one. It was called uh, TuneIn.com. I checked it out, and all of a sudden, 
uh, it was pulling down all the uh, FM stations from any zip code, which was great because now I can get all the local radio better reception than I did on the uh, the antenna uh, of my uh, stereo. If you listen to radio, it's one of the nicer sites I've come across for content aggregation, making it really easy and sort of just bookmarking um, all of these stations. Uh, you can also bookmark shows. So I went through a process over the last couple of months uh, back and forth with them, and I submitted uh, our radio show, and it got accepted, and they uh, are now syndicating it. So if you have a smartphone, a device, or a smart TV that does apps or Roku or any of this stuff, more than likely you can add uh, the TuneIn app and uh, subscribe now to the radio show there uh, as well. So now we're pretty much syndicated all over the place as far as internet radio goes, which is great. Anyway, so moving on, the Zeitgeist Media Festival 2013 main event, uh, of which I was part of the the core team that helped put this uh, event on. So I, I have a unique perspective from a person who's part of the putting on the technical aspects, the webcast, uh, recording the audio, getting the uh, sound mixed so it can be edited and get our videos published up on YouTube. And I, I know it's taken an incredibly long time to get to 2012 published onto the Media Festival YouTube channel. And uh, I can't help but apologize to them for the delay, but also know that it's an incredible amount of work to uh, actually go and the months of planning that it takes to put this all together and you know, have the event. And then, you know, on a volunteer basis on my own time uh, to get this stuff put together, I know there's an ongoing frustration to have the stuff done faster. And uh, we are moving as fast as we can with the resources that we have and also in, in the means that we have. So for anyone that has been part of the festival or been uh, waiting for content, I do apologize. I have been part of the pipeline on getting the videos done and getting the content published and uh, I'm doing my best. And also if you have a skill set, if you're an editor, if you're an audio mixer and you can run Pro Tools and multi-track and do mixes, uh, Make yourself known. Uh, send an email to uh, media at thezeitgeistmovement.com or to uh, jason at zmca.org and, and let us know that you're out there and that you're uh, willing to contribute. And then uh, maybe we can speed up this process a little bit. The Media Festival's main event happened once again. Our third annual main event happened in Los Angeles, uh, more specifically in the Avalon Theater in Hollywood, California. For anyone who hasn't been, uh, it's quite a beautiful theater. It opened in 1927 as a playhouse. It was called the Hollywood Playhouse. And the inside architecture, if you haven't had a chance to actually see it, it's worth a search on Google. Uh, maybe Google Images will point you in the right direction. Uh, it's an old Spanish Baroque style with a very ornate uh, plaster work on the inside. Of course, now it's a modern-day concert house, and it's been retrofitted with rock and roll truss and lots of moving and LED lighting and uh, a giant sound system. But the architecture is still there, and uh, it's quite nice. Anyway, the event started on time at 3 o'clock this past Sunday, August 4th. Uh, we had a lot of people participate uh, this year. Just to go down the, the list real quick here, I mean, we had bands from Lily Hayden to Hyrosonic to Lillian's Rose, performances by The Siren. We also had lots of artwork. Mirror One and Norton Wisdom. Uh, Mirror One's a muralist. But he also uh, did some black light uh, live performance painting. We had a live performance painter, uh, Norton Wisdom. If you've seen any of Lily Hayden's live videos, uh, he's off and off to the left of, or stage right, uh, which is uh, audience left, with his backlit canvas. It's just beautiful uh, to see uh, all the live art happen uh, while the bands perform. And the festival had a lot of different areas to it. We had a section out in front with the NPOs and all the tabling and the organizations doing uh, their activism out in the public. Yeah, we had uh, KPFK there, uh, the Green Party, we had ET3. We also had a freeandequal.org uh, that's headed up by Christina Tobin, really taking to task our political system. In the United States, we have a, what we call a two-party system. You know, it's supposed to be an open democracy, but it's not. It's a privately financed business class system of Republican, Democrat, and that's it. We do not have all people represented. We do not have all parties represented. And it's near impossible to even get onto the ballot and participate unless you have millions and millions of dollars in financial backing. And even that, if you're not in one of the two business class parties in the U.S., you just don't stand a chance of participating in any major election or any major position in our political system. Uh, we had a great presentation from uh, ET3. And I want to go back and check that out. That's a new PowerPoint uh, presentation from him, and I had not seen that before. That was just great news to hear that they're going to actually have a chance at building a 100-mile test track 
with plans for a global backbone. I mean, if this actually happens in my lifetime, uh, I'm going to look forward to uh, visiting Ben McLeish in London for lunch and then uh, coming back to Los Angeles to uh, finish the radio show. <laughs> Uh, and for anyone who's uh, listening for the first time today and kind of checking out the movement and they're like, well, what is the Zeitgeist Media Festival? The Media Festival is the best language is the mission statement. Um, the purpose of the Media Festival is to foster a global awareness through artistic expression that we all share the same basic needs, to understand that we are truly one family sharing one habitat and that our worldviews and hence social approach should reflect this fundamental global perspective. So ultimately, it is an attempt to have people reflect on their social values and to understand that we are all connected on this habitat that we share, and now that we live in a global society, and to understand what that means, to reflect on our own personal values, how they fit into the social landscape, and how sustainable they are, and to you know, design a world where we have a reduction in all of these outcomes that we are just sick and tired of, you know, the pollution and the crime and the corruption of uh, power and plus all the social stresses with uh, public health problems and cancer rates and uh, unemployment and debt and uh, all of the other attributes uh, to our social system. So this sets the media festival apart from the other forms of activism we do with the Zeitgeist Movement, such as Z-Day, which is like our version of TED Talks. And it's the day where we go through the train of thought and really express what it is the Zeitgeist Movement is advocating uh, in regards to a resource-based economic model, what that means, the components involved with the economic structure being based on resources in the physical world rather than uh, on a fiat system of money sequences, and basically taking a systems approach to social organization. So that's our intellectual day, and that works for the academic crowd and people who are interested in learning on that level. And also, you know, really encouraged for people who support the movement to uh, participate with the information on those days, because it's the backbone of being able to communicate this out into the public. But we also recognize the power of art, and the power of art, music, spoken word, written word, it's part of every great civilization uh, as an expression of human being, really. So taking that into account, the Media Festival is an approach uh, through the medium of art to be an expression of the cultural zeitgeist, the dominant social value of the day. And with that said, because I'm out in front uh, with the show, I miss out on a lot of the uh, stuff that goes on in other parts of the festival with the all the organizations that are there tabling uh, out in the front. I get to walk through and see them, but I don't get to engage very much uh, because I'm sort of tied to the webcast and the audio uh, recording and, and the live cameras that record the show. So I get a unique perspective because I actually get to see the whole show take place on stage with the comedians. And I mean, Chad Fisher, I love you. I laughed my ass off. Rick Overton, you are awesome. I've got some guy in a tie stuck in my head now. You know, I get to see the whole thing go down, technical problems and <laughs> as well, you know, which does stress us out a little bit. But uh, those aside, it was phenomenal. We were a little bit behind this year, but overall we pulled through. And as far as I can tell, the audience, they look past any technical problems and really engaged uh, with the show. Uh, one thing that came up cool, too, is we had a problem uh, with capacity. You know, we're always concerned about uh, are a lot of people going to show up and stuff like that. And uh, one of the problems we ended up having was that we were close to capacity on the floor. I think the floor holds like 600 people or so between the lobby area and the and the concert hall. And uh, we had to open up the mezzanine, which was great. And uh, say about 100 people filtered off upstairs because we had to stay within fire codes uh, at the venue. Uh, so that was a good problem to have. We also had our art gallery again this year put on by Brandon Christie. Uh, who coordinated that whole effort in uh, each media festival. We have had a gallery of art that is beautiful. Uh, we have pieces there from Brandon himself, from uh, our media festival artist, Ryan Reeves. Uh, we had a chapter member here, uh, Reba Melfa, who had her artwork on display. Pieces from Mir One, pieces from Banksy. I actually don't have all the names here in front of me. But uh, hopefully we had a lot of people who did photographs and video walkthroughs of that area. So if you weren't able to make the event, you'll get to see uh, what was created there. And just a note on the artwork, I, I have a newfound respect. I mean, I already had a respect for Abby Martin uh, from the RT Network, but I wasn't aware of what a talented artist she is. And uh, when she threw up the slides of her work, uh, it was breathtaking. Uh, Abby, you're amazing. I had no idea. Uh, that was incredible to see. And thank you for being part of our festival and uh, speaking so well about the social condition. So hopefully that gives you a sense of the festival and what it's about. I'm sure there'll be lots more to see over the next few weeks on our social networking and as people post their photos and clips. 
And as a final note on this topic, uh, I wanted to express a giant thank you to everyone that stepped up to help make this festival a success. We could not do it without you. Okay, so moving into the next topic. Something I went to in July, uh, and I had not really spent a whole lot of time with the Skeptic Society. Uh, I hadn't really looked into it. Uh, but anyway, I had an invitation uh, to go to what's called the Amazing Meeting. Their slogan is Fighting the Fakers. And uh, this meeting is an annual conference of the Skeptic Society. It's put on by the James Randi Foundation and uh, Skeptics, Inc., which I think is headed up by Michael Shermer. Uh, and again, it's called the Amazing Meeting, TAM for short, T-A-M. Because of what I do with the Zeitgeist Movement, you know, I maintain a website for a chapter and a newsletter. The person that was performing there invited me as a member of the press. Uh, therefore, I was comped. Otherwise, I would never be able to afford to go to this thing. And uh, it happens in Las Vegas, Nevada every year uh, in the summer. And what I was told by the person that invited me was that this is a science-based community based on critical thinking, evidence-based claims, and skepticism. Now, just to preface this before I get into it, I got a chance to uh, meet James Randi of, of JREF, of his foundation, and he is, he is a gentleman. He is a um, well-spoken, intelligent, uh, now old man, uh, who also learned was a magician as well. Uh, and he has spent his life basically debunking superstition. And uh, on that level of the paranormal and all the other things uh, that fall under uh, superstitious thought in the world, I can see where there's nothing but a benefit to have these things looked at from the lens of the scientific method and to see how things work. Uh, and not just label things we can't explain as supernatural or magical. Most of the claims from the paranormal realm fall within the scope of chance. So if you were to say uh, they had a demonstration of uh, you hold one of these divining rods to find water in the ground, when you do a real experiment with it where you're not allowed to manipulate uh, the conditions but actually just try and find you know, which box had the glass of water under it or however they do it, uh, you find that the people who claim it works have the same success as someone who just goes up there randomly and, and does it by chance. So on that level, the Skeptic Society, I actually do appreciate their work. And there is a large overlap with the uh, atheist community. Uh, and out of the tables and tables of books that they had there, all the authors that presented uh, all had their books for sale and made like this little you know, complete circuit of uh, advertising uh, your own literature to your own crowd. But when you look through the books and all the people tabling there, the majority of the conversation is on religion, uh, its history, and uh, the problems today with thinking that a religious view is a fact-based view, and the problems it causes with people relating to each other when they view the Bible as historically accurate, rather than as a, a collection of human experience and allegory. You know, and the wisdom that comes through understanding themes of mythology rather than blindly believing that everything in one book is historical fact. So that being said, uh, I went not knowing much about this society, and I thought there'd be a ton of overlap with the Zeitgeist Movement and the skeptics. And all I have to say, the short version, uh, is I couldn't have been more wrong. I had no idea what I was getting into. Fortunately, I had a press pass because this event is very expensive if you actually pay the 500 bucks uh, for the ticket, plus get yourself out to Las Vegas and then hotels. You know, that weekend easily costs you $1,000 plus. Uh, anyway, I got uh, comped uh, as press for the event, and I am writing a little article which I'll publish at some point when I get my head around all this information. Now, I sat through 30 hours of talks. Uh, it's a three-day event, and they have uh, basically, this is what I could see our, our Z-Day event eventually becoming when things get large enough. Uh, they had about 1,100 people in attendance, uh, and 50% of those people were brand new. But each day is just packed full of presentations, and, uh, and then, of course, they have the entertainment at night. But I sat through and took notes on a lot of these speakers, and uh, I'll have to say one of the things that uh, jumped out at me is that there is uh, a lot of debate within a limited framework of capitalism and democracy. And they use these words as if they're presupposed givens of human nature. Uh, I mean, the semantic problem right there is if you walk up to someone and say, you know, uh, capitalism, freedom, and democracy, it's like, you know, you'd get a different definition from every single person you talk to. And a lot of people may not know what to say to ask them to define those terms. But ultimately, what I see this as is 
status quo. So anything that's outside of the realm of capitalism, anything that's outside of the realm of the political process that we see on TV of our two-party, corporate-backed, demo-publican system of politics, uh, anything outside of those two paradigms is a conspiracy. Now, fortunately, I had you know, the Zeitgeist movement on my press badge, and people did not know, for the most part, no one had heard of the Zeitgeist movement. I met three people that knew the word Zeitgeist, and they physically backed away from me when I introduced myself as some uh, press for the Zeitgeist movement. And they uh, were like, oh, that conspiracy stuff, why are you here? And the people that knew the word Zeitgeist only really knew it from Peter's first film. The community really latched on, from what I can tell, to you know the religious part, because it's sort of right in line with all the literature that I saw there in the atheist community. But the second they hit the 9-11 part, uh, they're done with it. It's a conspiracy theory. It's been shelved, categorized, and it's resolved as a conspiracy. It's put on the shelf with all resolved, debunked things, never to be brought up again. Uh, and that's sort of the attitude uh, with the skeptics when they look at information. Um, I'm sorry to say it, but it's a very judgmental and dogmatic view to take information like this and lock it away uh, as fixed, as liberated as they think they are from their religious roots. And um, two of the people I didn't really have any success with, but one person, I, I don't know if it stuck or not, but, but when I walked away from a conversation of what the Zeitgeist Movement was about, science applied to social concern, uh, the elements of what's involved, you know, I had the two-minute window to try to express a resource-based economic model, which is near impossible. But when I, I hit the bullet points and he kind of had to stop and go, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't know there was a second film. Oh, I didn't know there was a third film. That was one attribute I noticed in this community um, that was positive, and I wanted to point that out, is that when I engaged people, um, this was one of the first times I actually sat down and talked to people, and they, they were open about not knowing something. They were like, I don't understand what you're saying. Uh, that's unfamiliar to me. I actually don't know anything about that. Um, rather than just smile and nod their head through your conversation, pretending that they actually get what you're saying, uh, I had more people stop me and say, wow, I have no idea what uh, about human behavior in the environment, or I don't understand that part of uh, economics, um, or I've never heard of this topic before. Uh, so as far as the, the people roaming around that I bumped into, um, uh, I heard that more often than not. also met some very curmudgeon people that thought I was f just plain old fucking crazy because of uh, my conversation went outside the realms of capitalism and democracy. So I'm going to probably just take a few minutes and focus on one thing that really got my goat. I know who Michael Shermer is, and I've appreciated his work, especially on religion. Um, what I did not know uh, was his position of politics and money, and economics, I should say. He did a presentation entitled Science and Moral Progress, which at the end of his presentation was kind of misnamed. It should have been labeled uh, How Awesome Democracy and Capitalism Are. It's so awesome. I just sat there and watched how blinded they were by its awesomeness. Uh, I was sitting with a couple of people who I was friends with uh, from the person that invited me. And uh, they watched me throughout this presentation. And one of them finally put their hands on my shoulder. And they said, wow, I can tell that you are outwardly angry. What did he say that set you off? Um, one of the things that was sort of the crux of his argument on why democracy is so fantastic for the world and the only thing that we need is more of it uh, democracy and capitalism. And the only problem is that we need more ethics. We need more, more, we need to be more moral and we need more participation from people in an ethical way. Okay. So this is what they fall back on. When things don't work, when they look at system problems, they just say, oh, well, we just need to keep doing what we're doing and then blame people and then, you know, inject, like you have a syringe of ethics and you can just inject it into your socioeconomic system. And that's supposed to solve the problem. They're blind to the systemic root cause. They will not acknowledge it. And what set me off with Michael's presentation was that he used the exact same 2005 World Health Organization chart on poverty, and he manipulated it and spun it to support his argument about why the democracy in the form that we have it now and capitalism in the form that we have it now is good and how it's solely responsible. Yes, solely responsible for the moral progress that we have seen in the world. And from where I was sitting, all presented in the most non-scientific way. 
And I looked around the audience and everyone was just sitting there nodding their head, falling victim to the fallacy of authority where they just, because he's their guru, they just ate it up. And so ultimately what he was saying, he took a dollar twenty-five poverty, he took that figure, okay, one dollar and twenty-five cents a day, what the UN uses for a that's the poverty line, like that's any kind of quality of life, right? He took that and said, because it has gone down over the last couple of decades, dollar twenty-five a cent day poverty has decreased. This was his argument. And because it's decreased, it's decreased because of capitalism and democracy and the rise of democracy in the world. And therefore, it's good and we need whole lots more of it. Okay, and I'm generalizing, but that, that was sort of the, the message here. I'm just going to boil it down to that for the sake of the show and time. And then he moved on. And I sat there and I wanted to like really stop the show and call him out on what a crock of bullshit that was. Because... I use the exact same chart. If you go and I had did a Z Day talk this year in March and um, on a systems approach and visualizing a systems approach is what it was called, and I use that to show that you had dollar twenty five a day poverty, and when you're looking at outcomes of a system and how a system is meeting human needs, you have to take the whole system into account. And what he didn't do was move the chart over. If you move the chart over to double their lifestyle, you double in economic terms. And you give them $2.50 a day. Is their life better? Is that better? Is that resolved in meeting their needs? Not even mentioned. And I think his figure was that uh, the dollar twenty-five poverty had been reduced by half uh, in the last two decades. While ignoring the fact that the higher levels of poverty have grown. They've grown enormously. They've grown more than the dollar twenty-five has dropped. And if you count for inflation, it, it changes the story even more. What he's saying is not even remotely accurate. I took my chart and I expanded it all the way out. And so you got a billion and a half people at deprivation. You've got 3 billion people living at $2.50 a day. This is 2005 data. So if you expand out the chart, you'll see that at $10 a day, you have 80% of the world's population living on $10 or less per day for total access to their life needs. That's all you have. That's rent, food, clothing, housing, health care, if you can afford it uh, at 10 bucks a day, everything. Okay, it's not 10 bucks for, you know, for your lunch. And when you look at that, it's like this system doesn't work for the majority of the planet. And there's no recognition of this. We know, technically, that we can meet the basic human needs of everyone on Earth right now. We have the resources, the skill, and the technology to actually provide for that. But this system won't allow for it. He took his $1.25 and just said, oh, well, over the last two decades, $1.25 poverty has decreased by 50%, and it's because of our system. And the thing he didn't take into account either was inflation. Well, if you go back 20 years... What is a dollar twenty-five a day? Is it five bucks? Is it ten bucks? I mean, the value back then was a whole lot more as life need purchasing power than it is today, not accounted for. So he just blindly stumbled through all this stuff and puts the economics in terms of democracy and just says, then this is why it's good, and we just need a whole lot more of it, and we just need to be more moral and ethical. Um, what I finally figured out, I think if I was understanding like the mindset of what I was uh, witnessing, is that when you say democracy, it's capitalism, two-party politics, and voting is probably what is in their mind when they say that word. That's the box in which you operate in. That's the box in which you think inside of. And anything outside of that box, which the Zeitgeist Movement's train of thought, is totally outside that box. It's completely outside. It makes that box irrelevant. And so I can see where there is a long way to go uh, with crossing any sort of a bridge in communication with the skeptic society and the zeitgeist movement. There is no overlap. I was so disappointed to find this out from, a, from the statement that was made to me at the outset that you know, here is a critical thinking, evidence-based scientific community that has no listening, has no listening whatsoever for basically what would be in the orientation guide in the PDF. Now, that's a generalization, and I'm only generalizing because inside of that audience space, as I looked around at the faces of the people while I was watching these presentations go by, uh, ultimately all I saw was agreement 
Um, so on that level is why I'm making my statements. Uh, now, before anyone listening to the show thinks this is just a, a uh, skeptic bashing, Tam bashing uh, bit, it's not. It's an incredible event. It's well organized. Uh, the ticket price is high. Again, uh, James Randy is a gentleman, and I appreciate his work, and the guys that organized this event were great. I will say there are some personalities inside of this movement. It's very guru-oriented. I was going to call someone out for being really rude openly and publicly towards another person. I think I'll just skip over that. Let's just say that I was unimpressed by some of the gurus of the Skeptic Society in their behavior. They, they have egos uh, and attitudes uh, as bad as any I've ever seen. Now, the other thing I want to go through, this was a three-day event. I sat through 30 hours of talks. There is some really good stuff going on in here uh, as far as what people were presenting. You know, do I recommend that you go and sit through it? Well, actually, if you were there in the capacity to sort of bridge the gap and take in some of the information, find the good stuff and pull it out, uh, I'd certainly recommend it, but it's a high ticket price. You know, it might make it out of reach for uh, a lot of movement members because I know we're all, we're all broke. <laughs> uh, some of the things that I heard, there was a presentation uh, done on uh, the media and this manipulative ploy that they put out called you decide quote unquote you decide where you you put up an argument and you let the audience decide this was something i really loved because the presenter uh, her name was sharon hill um i don't have details right now just for the sake of time of the show i'm gonna um i I just want to look at the the message of what was being said and and uh but where this this idea of you decide is put forth through social media and 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 through uh talk shows and stuff it's viewed as a democratic process which ultimately this becomes a ploy of manipulation because what happens is two sides are presented and they're given equal weight. There are two sides that have unequal evidence. So you, have, you always have this this or that, us and them, uh, basically what's known as a false dichotomy. But it's put forth as something for you to choose from. But these two sides are always presented and they have unequal evidence, but they're given equal weight in their presentation. They both suffer insufficient information, and if you decide was to actually be useful or fair uh, as a mechanism, all sides would be presented. All sides would be represented, and they're not. And this is why this you decide tool that's used in the media quite often for people to participate in some sort of, they think they're exercising some sort of power, some sort of uh, democratic process, and they're not. They're just being manipulated into a false dichotomy, and then uh, it's polarizing is ultimately what it is. Uh, and it can be used for further manipulation uh, in the future. Uh, there was work done by a gentleman named uh, Marty Klein that I liked. I wrote down a note here. In his presentation, it was like, what you think problems are drive what you view as solutions. That jumped out at me because it put into a context a great way to view you know, when you're thinking inside of voting politics and free market capitalism, you know, the market system, if those are the frameworks in which you view the world and those are fixed, they're presupposed as human nature and given, they're like the law of gravity. Uh, if that's the framework in which you, you think, what you think problems are will drive what you view as solutions. And that couldn't be more true. It's so well said. So your solutions are only going to come up within the framework in which you think if you have a spectrum of ideas that are fixed by presupposed ways of organizing ourselves, your solutions are only going to come out of that. And they're not going to work because they're going to be limited by the framework itself. And that's why I can see why the skeptic society falls back on this fallacy of all we need is more ethics, more laws, more more morals. We need to be more moral and get more of this out, you know, inject more ethics into the the system as the solution. And I'm just like No, you're just going to be stepping on ants forever. You're just going to be locking people up forever while your prison populations overrun your ability to deal with them. And also, just to um, balance this out, not all people in the skeptic community are like this. I met a group of Australian skeptics, they called themselves. They're doing some really good work. I I know I'm not going to do justice to the name. Joanne uh, Benhamu, I think her name is, did a presentation on standing up for science in Australia, uh, obviously putting it into the context that we have a global problem uh, with science in the public mindset. And they uh, were quite different in their disposition uh, and, and did not fit the profile of what I observed from the U.S. Skeptic Society. 
So for the three days uh, of talks that I sat through and took notes on, I was listening within the context of the train of thought the movement advocates. We're looking at the Earth system. We're using systems theory, a systems approach, looking through that lens at the presentations. And people came up and they would bump up against the edges of the problems of the profit incentive. And they would bump up against the edge, a few of them did, of a system problem. And then they would shy away from it. And they would always go back to, we need more of this, we need more of that. Keep the system as is. Just put more of this in, you know, sprinkle in a little more equality and sprinkle in a little more ethics and then, you know, we'll be good. I was listening that whole weekend and I finally did. There was one person, uh, let me find my notes here. Okay, the person's name, I believe, was Dan Airely and uh, his presentation on how we lie to everyone, especially ourselves. (laughs) A standard theory of dishonesty. Uh, He uh, put it down to is a cost-benefit analysis, which is a great way to uh, look at the psychology involved uh, in a competitive system where it's every person out for themselves. You have to take care of yourself first, and that's supposed to equal the benefit of everybody. Um, Now that I say that, it sounds like complete nonsense to me, but of course that was the uh, paradigm uh, I was indoctrinated into. Uh, He did go on to speak about uh, there is a distance between the action and the consequence and how it affects you personally, your cost-benefit analysis, basically. And the more distance there is, there's more of a propensity to engage in lying or cheating. He made a comment on uh, the money system uh, and its decoupling effects of the consequences, you know, in the forms of stocks, margins, derivatives, etc. You know, where he actually, his premise was Wall Street is a system of a conflict of interest uh, when it comes to well-being, health, and the environment. He was the first person out of all the presentations to really put it into context to connect the corruption that we suffer as a system structure problem. I don't know how much of the audience took this in. I mean, and this goes back to why I chose the uh, opening montage. It's like, this is how John McMurtry is trying to put uh, into language the problems of capitalism and its decoupling nature from the physical world in which we, you know, which we depend. So uh, there was some good stuff to be heard. uh, But overall, um, the mindset that I came up against, there was such little overlap Uh, And I walked away from the amazing meeting uh, amazingly disappointed in that regard. That's not to take away from the amazing personalities that put the thing together, how well organized it is, uh, and how much content that they packed in, and and how many people it brings in. Nothing but impressed on that level. But uh, there's a long way to go, and there's a lot of bridging the gap to be done. Would there be a benefit in getting this community that's supposed to be a scientific-based, critical thinking, evidence-based community, you would think that there'd be nothing but overlap and openness for the movement's train of thought. And, well, we have a long way to go there, uh, and that's the short of it. And that was my experience uh, in a nutshell. So I'm going to wrap things up here for the the podcast today. Uh, Again, um, if you are new to uh, John McMurtry, please check out his book, Cancer Stage of Capitalism. It'll take a long time, uh, if you're unfamiliar with his work, to uh, absorb it. Uh, But it's it's excellent at distilling down the problems of our current economic structure. Uh, Also, the media festival, the zeitgeistmediafestival.org. As we get our content published and the high-resolution versions of all the video from the day, Uh, mixed and edited we'll publish our content there and also on the media festival channel yeah you know take a look at tam and uh, the skeptic society but also you know be prepared for uh, little to no overlap with what we're advocating and be prepared for uh, the listening of the people who associate with that group uh, to be very closed to what you have to say anyway that's my time and i thank everyone for listening My name is Jason Lord. I've been your host for this episode of the Zeitgeist Movement's uh, bi-monthly podcast. I think we're going to a bi-monthly schedule now. And uh, we'll check the schedule and get an announcement out for who will be hosting the next show. And I hope to see you all very soon. Uh, Keep on learning. Keep advocating this train of thought out to the world and living a great life. See you next time. Bye for now.